watch a drama. You say you wanna watch a comedy. Well, you can watch it with your mama, or you can watch it with your daddy. You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler, so you can come and talk around our water cooler. We'll watch it all day and all night. Couch potatoes unite. Whoa, whoa. Couch potatoes unite. Whoa. Welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because it's our version of the serpents. It's our way to have a united front, though we don't have leather biker jackets for the record. I'm the blogger in question and the self-styled Chief Couch Potato. My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For at Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU, exclamation point, hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays. And as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, via Google Play, and now on Spotify to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including but not limited to Fuller House, Westworld, Arrested Development, Jane the Virgin, Schitt's Creek, Doctor Who, Supernatural, and Orange is the New Black. Plus new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Gotham, Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, iZombie, Mar- Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., 13 Reasons Why, The Crown, American Horror Story, Grace and Frankie, The Good Place, Altered Carbon, the Marvel's Defender series panel will conclude its run talking Jessica Jones Season 3, the DCTU series will tackle the crisis on Infinite Earths, and the Star Trek 50 Plus series will chat the second season of The Next Generation. We'll be launching new panels covering the chilling adventures of Sabrina, Mr. Robot, Charmed, Outlander, the Breaking Bad universe, and This Is Us. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll take a smallish look back at a short-term show from some kind of yesteryear called Freaks and Geeks. We'll put out some musical stops for our crazy ex-girlfriend, we'll revisit one of the all-time and most watched classic sitcoms in MASH, and we'll consider the moral implications and quick cancellation of Dollhouse. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? We've been live from bunkers, comedy shows, and comic cons, and we just went live last spring from Bluebridge Games to take a shiny look back at Firefly. Plus, we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff, I guarantee you. So make sure you like or follow us at our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play and on Spotify. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow panels and I still write reviews and we always seek new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback, just not the black hood kind. For obvious reasons. Today we're around the water cooler and continuing our look at CW dark teen drama Riverdale. This episode constitutes the second of a multi-part catch-up miniseries in which CPU will look at each past season of Riverdale before continuing the panel as one of our typical water cooler features. If you're not already aware, you should know that from time to time your chief couch potato and main moderator that's me, needs a break, particularly when I think others are more passionate about the show for whatever reason we're discussing in the moment. Case in point, today's episode, which I'm not here to moderate, rather frequent panelist Sarah returns to the moderating microphone for this series. She's appeared, of course, on numerous panels, including our Star Trek 50 Plus series panel, our Arrested Development panel, our Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt panel, and others too many to list, and she also co-moderates our American Horror Story panel. In this episode, Sarah is rejoined by panelists Emily, Micah, Nate, Jessica, Gabby, and me kicking back as a panelist. In addition, remember when I said we had some surprises in store? Well, today's episode also includes a special bonus, an interview with actress Sarah Habel, who played teacher Geraldine Grundy in season one and the first episode of season two. Make sure you stick around for that after the panel discussion concludes. So without further ado, I would like to welcome back Sarah to the moderating microphone. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Kylie. Riverdale is based loosely on the Archie comics in the general universe. Riverdale began airing on the CW in 
January 2017 and showed us our beloved Archie characters with a dark twist. Season 2 featured many plot points, including the vigilante serial killer The Black Hood, the ongoing feud between the Serpents and the Ghoulies, as well as the Southsiders versus the Northsiders, the resignation of Mayor McCoy and the election of the new mayor, Hiram Lodge and his secret plan to take over the South Side, which includes Archie working with Hiram, and the secret lives of two homosexual students, including secret forest meetings and a reprogramming by the Sisters of Quiet Mercy. That's the most times I've said secret ever. <laughs> So, we have a lot to talk about. Let's get to it. You are going to be asked to identify yourself by first name only and remind us how you came to watch Riverdale. You're also going to be asked to rank yourself as one of the following characters from Riverdale. You love this show because of the great depiction of small town living, both the good and the bad. Since, after all, you are a small town girl or guy at heart, even though you have a secret dark side like Betty Cooper, you think this show is a breath of fresh air, a refreshing change from most of the emotionally turbulent things you've been exposed to, although recently you have decided that getting your hands dirty is worth it, like Veronica Lodge. You like this show, but have a somewhat complex relationship with it, similar to your quasi-mob boss protege relationship with your girlfriend's father, like Archie Andrews. This show sucks. Everyone thinks it's so great, but you see it for the gritty, disturbing portrayal it really is, and frankly, if you have to join a gang to make your opinion known, you will, like Jughead Jones. It's fine. Everything is fine. This show is fine. You are the shining example of perfection and not even a ton of disturbing deaths and a gruesome mystery are going to bring you down as long as you can have the lead in the school musical like Cheryl Blossom. Look, you sort of like this show, but it's not really on your radar. You are coexisting with it because you must, but it's really just a frank distraction from your mother's disgusting affair with Sheriff Keller like Josie without her pussy gats. You didn't even watch this show as you were in prison and have bigger problems, such as taking over the South Side, such as Hiram Lodge and, spoiler, Hal Cooper. Who wants to go first? I'm Jessica. Hi, Hi Jessica. Jessica. I came to watch Riverdale because I love the Arch Comics and I wanted to see where they ran with it, and I've been hooked ever since. For this one, I'm going to be a Veronica Lodge. I love that it is a breath of fresh air. It is emotionally turbulent, and it's nitty-gritty, and I'm ready to keep rolling with it. So I'll be V this time. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Jessica. Well, every V needs a B, so spoilers on what my response is. This is Micah. Hi, Micah. Hi, Micah. Hello. And I am going to go with Betty Cooper for my character reflection this time. Although, in terms of, like, the dark side, just in trying to share my love of Riverdale with other people, I've found that liking Riverdale essentially is the dark side of Riverdale. <laughs> so, it's been, this this podcast is now my haven. Aww. Aww. Well, welcome back, Thanks, Micah. Micah. Good to be back. I'm Emily. Hi, Hi Emily. Emily. I started watching Riverdale. I turned it on. I turned on season one right when it came on Netflix. I watched like the first three episodes and I was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. And then I fell off watching it. And then I got back into it because I forgot that I had agreed to do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so then I jumped back into it and I'm like, oh, wait, I really do like this. So I think for season two, I'm a Betty Cooper like Micah. And I think for the first time ever, I'm only going to be one person. <laughs> this is like huge shocking news, shocking. everybody. Because normally I'm like two to five. So <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because Sarah's descriptions are very straightforward. Thank you. I so what? I are you that. trying to backhand me? <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> yours are, they can be very complex, and so I like to take the different <laughs> stuff mm -hmm. out of it. I still think she's trying to backhand me. No! <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I'm a Betty Cooper. I loved season two. I thought season two was really fantastic, and I can't wait to talk about it. Good. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. I am Nate. Hi, Nate. Hi, Nate. Hi, Nate. Hi. I got to watch the show because I, like most of you, am an Archie Comics fan. I read about this show when it was going to debut. Then forgot about it, and then found it on Netflix and binged and binged and binged. And if I were to pick somebody who my most like, I would all, I would say this season it was Archie Andrews. I think complicated relationship with this one. Right, welcome back, Nate. Hi, Thank you. I'm Gabby. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Gabby. I came to watch Riverdale because it was on Netflix and I was bored, but also because Cole Sprouse is in it and he was one of my 
favorite childhood actors. Did you have a little crush on him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all do. Even when it's age inappropriate. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> you like what you like. <laughs> I think I'm going to identify with... <laughs> Did you want us to assign you one? <laughs> Is it complicated? Sh yeah. You're Archie? Yeah. Or, or, Cher or Cheryl. Just or Cheryl. Because, like, it's just fine. Like, <laughs> this, this season is, I think, just the start of the landslide mm -hmm. that is going to happen. So. Or Cheryl. <laughs> Welcome back, Thanks, Gabby. Gabby. I'm Kylie. Hi, Kylie. Hi. 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 I, I already Hi. talked, and I'm not moderating, so I get to do this. <laughs> Woo! I came to watch Riverdale for two reasons. A, a bunch of people that are now talking on this podcast requested to talk about the show. <laughs> <laughs> and B, actually, this was one of... If you know me or you follow the blog or you follow the podcast, you know that we look to see what's coming out. Mm -hmm. We kind of make some predictions about what we're going to pick up, what we're going to pass. Riverdale was a pickup show just because I knew between the Archie Comics thread, Luke Perry being in the show, a few other people, maybe the Cole Sprouses of the world, that people were going to like it. I thought there was a good, good chance that I was going to like it. I think last time I was Archie, and I'm sticking with Archie, I think I'll perennially have a complicated relationship with this show. There are things I like and things I don't. I keep describing it as trashy, but is it the good kind of trashy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm still working on that. <laughs> I can't stop watching it when I do watch it. But then when I'm away from it for a while, I'm like, do I really want to come back? Uh -huh. So that's where I'm at. Complicated relationship. Okay. Thanks, Kylie. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I'm Sarah, and I started watching this show because my college roommate is Sarah Hamill, and she played Geraldine Grundy, and I pretty much try to watch anything she's in. So Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, hi to me or hi to her? Hi to both. Hi to her, all of both. Uh, this time I said I was Cheryl as well. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you wrote that one with you in mind, didn't you? Kind of. <laughs> also, I'll pretty much watch anything if you're going to give me the lead in a musical. So that That's sort of fits true. there. Like, I just, I'm just i there for that. I'm there for that. So foreshadowing to the excitement <laughs> that I'm going to talk about later <laughs> about the musical. The season two musical. Oh, yes. It's so good. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about season two in general. What did you like? What did you dislike? If you want to get specific, get specific. Or if you want to stay general, stay general. So I love, I don't remember if you remember last time, Emily, when you were talking about like the visions and like how beautiful it was cinematically. Yeah. I loved the beginning when Cheryl was in that white dress with the red mark uh -huh. where Archie's dad got shot. Yeah. Like, and then she went and kissed him. Like, that whole, like, opening scene, I just was like, yep, I'm here. We're doing this. Let's go. <laughs> but it just kept the, like, cinematic, like, beauty of it from season one. It's just visually pleasing. Even if there's moments where storyline, you're like, can't do it. But it's nice to look at. So uh -huh. I'm going to look at it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know. I'm trying to, like, remember season two. I watched it so long ago. Right after season one, I, like, quickly binged season two. But, like, I'm always a huge fan of their cine the cinematography of this show. Like, even if there are times that I'm like, oh, do I really want to keep watching this? I just will watch it because it's so beautiful. They did such a fantastic job with it. I think my favorite part about the show in general, but which really comes out in season two, is the serpent storyline. The mm -hmm. Jones family. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like Skeet Ulrich as mm -hmm. F.P. Jones. I know. Him. He's actually super hot now, and he wasn't as hot in Scream. That's just my feelings. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, know. I, think he's I just learned today that his real name was Brian Trout. Oh. oh okay. But he changed huh. to Skeet Ulrich. I don't know. <laughs> Fine. I don't don't judge him. That's sad. I don't want to be weird, but my husband reminds me a little of Ski Ulrich. They will have like dark eyes. See, now that you've said that, and I've met him, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can sort of see that one. Yeah. Other comparisons, maybe not. But yeah, I really like. I like the sort of Hamlet esque. Since we're talking about Hamlet, <laughs> yeah, it's real Shakespearean. It's kind of yeah. a Shakespearean tragedy over in the Jones family, mm -hmm. and they are eminently more 
interesting to watch, I think, sometimes than, say, the Lady Macbeth Macbeth in the Hiram Lodge, Hermione would, Lodge situation. I would entirely agree with that. I think the Hiram Hermione relationship can sometimes get a little, what's the right word I'm looking for, a little daunting, I guess, or a little boring, even. Sometimes I'm just like, really, we're going back and forth about this again? But the Jones family, I think, is really interesting to watch and really engaging. Yeah, I definitely felt that Hermione was a much more interesting character in season in one yes. when Hiram was still just this kind of like shadow boogeyman who we didn't know who he was. That being said, I think Mark Consuelos is doing a very good job with the role. Oh, yeah. He definitely, yeah. I think, lives up to the hype. See, I don't know that I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time we see him is this season. Yeah. I find Mark Consuelos' acting to be subpar compared to some of the other adults on the show. Yeah. yeah. I can see it. Sometimes okay. he gets a little repetitive mm -hmm. in some of his acting choices. It's very one note. Yeah. And maybe that's what he was directed to do. I don't. I haven't seen him when he was on the soap opera, so I don't know. Yeah. But I just, I, I find him to be the weakest link. I think the charm to Mark Consuelos is, is that he is handsome and charming, and that's it. Like that's, <laughs> and that is why he is so good at being a mob boss. That's why people trust him. He's got, you know, a really nice serpent smile, and that's all he needed to be right now. It's that, you know, he's supposed to be glad-handing everybody, making them feel safe and secure. I think it was, it was an inter- like, I mean, maybe it was inadvertent. It was a good choice to have him be kind of just kind of one note before you start to realize how horrible he really is. True, but it's 22 episodes a season, so the one note gets awfully <laughs> long. <laughs> no, it's yeah. Do we One think that was like? Episodes, yeah. Do we think that was the writing, the directing, the acting, or just a perfect storm of that? Perfect storm. I think it was a perfect yeah. storm. Yeah. I think the the lodge storyline, even through season three, is very one note and very much like okay, the lodges are buying up, spending all their money and buying stuff cool great like they're just taking control but it's not even really like they're taking control it's like the things that they're doing they're like power moves air quotes power moves but they don't really seem to affect much of anything like not when you have serial killers running around exactly up things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so i think yeah. that like that is what gets kind of annoying to me is that it seems to be very one note and i think that all has to do with the writing well, uh, yeah, the, and from a writing standpoint, it really smacks of like a 1980s movie yes. where <laughs> they much. are the rich people and they are buying up this small town, but where normally you would have a team of goonies like the Archie and Betty and Jughead fighting to keep the town. They're like, well, let's have them be distracted in this B story with supernatural serial killers and things like that. So it really, yeah, it got, that's where that's where the complicated life comes in for me in this season is where it's like on one hand you're just like oh man what a great story and then you're like 20 minutes 20 minutes talking about the the black hood well that's a pretty good segue into our next question which was this season has a lot of dark music scary movie episode names especially the dark hood episodes and the dark hood like sort of storyline so watcher in the woods the town that dreaded sundown when a stranger calls those are all the names mm -hmm. of the titles we have tony todd who played the candy man makes it oh appearance. yeah they play the song season of the witch and when grundy is murdered they're singing the theme from rosemary's baby yep. so this is yeah. all kind of spiced in there so how did that work for you did that sort of tie in those themes I liked yeah. that they kind of made it like a theme like that and then like they did carry the musical like mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of a cool way to tie everything together and like I like when shows do that they like pick a theme and they kind of stick with it so I think I thought that was interesting and like a fun way to keep it more interesting i've just said that word like a billion times <laughs> like secret <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> our buzzwords like for the day are secret and interesting yes. <laughs> the secret word ah! <laughs> so to go to the serial killer plot line and sort of the horror theme because we'll eventually talk about season three as well i thought it worked better in season two to have this theme. Mm -hmm. The Black Hood storyline was repetitive, however, the ultimate identity of who he was, I did not expect 
that. It did catch Who was me. it, Kylie? It was Hal Cooper, mm -hmm. Betty's dad. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. I know, spoiler. And I did not expect that to be the case. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. they did a really good job of misdirecting. Horror genre is not typically my favorite, and yet I watch mm -hmm. a lot. I don't know why. <laughs> we make you. We keep making you. I know. <laughs> I will say I'm the same way. I do not love being scared, although for somebody that doesn't like it, I sure end up watching a lot of that crap. Not <laughs> yeah, so Lachlan Monroe plays Hal Cooper. One of the things that was really interesting to me is they kept talking about dead eyes. The guy in the, in the hood, he's got these dead eyes in his eyes. But then it's like, oh, it's just him. He has normal eyes. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't His know. eyes don't look dead to me. But. <laughs> but at different times, various people were pretending to be the Black Hood. Yeah. But he's the mm. ultimate kind of mastermind. So did anybody see that coming? I yeah. actually... Yeah. Gabby yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, yeah. I did. There was, there was one moment, and I don't remember when it was. I think it was when... I think it was actually when he shot... Fred in Pops, they like showed his eyes and I was like, oh my god, is that is that Hal? And then they like misdirect you through the rest of that storyline and so I'm like, oh, it, it can't be him. And then when they revealed it, I was like, oh my god. But that was the only like inclination that I had of it. Like after mm -hmm. that, I was like, no, it can't be him. Like they're showing so much other stuff. He has said in an interview that he didn't know it was him and he never mm -hmm. wore the hood <laughs> until that's the funny. very last episode. It oh, was None crazy. of that. It was all a mm -hmm. stuntman so he didn't know either. Oh. But then he said they were like feeding. He was starting to get the idea. He's like, I think it might be me. Like, I'm not sure this might be me, but that's kind of crazy. Like, and they did, like you mentioned, they did a good job of like keeping you off his like scent, if you will. Because yeah. I can't remember what it was, but when they were all at some like, was it the Jubilee speech or something where mm. he's there and the Black Hood is shooting? Like, yeah. okay, you're not going to assume it's Hal because he's there. Yeah. So they really did a good job of like, giving you reasons to not think it's him if you were already on that tail. So yeah. I was blind. At the same time, when I was like going back and rewatching season two, now knowing who it was, there are little tiny bits and pieces here and there where you can see like, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. But the one that I really loved, it was, I think, a few episodes before the big reveal. The Black Hood gives Betty a call using the voice distortion thing, and then when she ends the call, Jughead comes in and says, was that your mom? And she, like, pauses for a second, so she says, no, it was my dad. And I was like, Betty doesn't know that that's her dad, but that is very much her dad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she subconsciously knew. Ooh, right. She is a smarty mm -hmm. pants. She also has the dark she side. She has that dark side. <laughs> <laughs> I like Dark Betty, personally. Uh -huh. I think she's yes. wonderful. I would like to see more Dark Betty. <laughs> Did you kind of drop off on that whole like subplot a little bit? I think they it's used Chick yeah. to kind of just explain it away a little bit, but that that's Chick is a whole whole other thing, and just as in general impressions, wasn't a big fan of him as a character or as, like, a device throughout the season. Did you think right away that Chick wasn't really her brother? Did anybody think it? Yes. I yeah, teeter-tottered oh, yeah. on it for a long time. It was very loose. Like, when he's staring wasn't... over her while she's sleeping and they're playing that, like, B-grade version of the Stranger's theme, the Stranger Things theme, mm -hmm. like, when he first moves in. That's when you're just like, oh, there's something amiss here. He is yeah. not who he says he is. Yeah, so Chick was somebody that she thought was her brother, her half-brother, who would have been the son of F.P. Alice, F. Alice and, and Alice. Alice. Yeah. So I guess Jughead's brother, also too. Creepy. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> just keeping it in the family. And yeah. he was a male escort slash webcam stripper. Yeah, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Shady. And then he taught her how to do that webcam grossness. I don't know. But then you went <laughs> against her later too yeah. when she turned against him. Uh -huh. He was like, oh, yeah. well, guess what? Your daughter's messed up, Alice. And then yeah. he murdered someone in her house, in Betty's house and made them hide the body. And then FP had to come help out. It was just the whole thing. It, it was. It was the whole thing. It was, I feel like it was a lot on top of the whole Black Hood thing going on. I felt like it, that got a little tedious at mm -hmm. times. But I was like, Ugh, really? We're still dealing with Chick. And like, there was so much back and forth about it. And then when like Polly came in too and like, 
it was just, that was a lot for me. <laughs> I feel like they had a lot of really good ideas that they wanted to do, but they were like, we need to do it all now. Mm -hmm. Like, right now. Well, so now I'll be in defense of it. At least Chick was paid off as a motivation for Hal to become the Black Hood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise it would have been completely superfluous and annoying. Yeah. So. I didn't totally hate Chick. I just, it, it was pretty apparent right away that that's not her brother yeah. to mm -hmm. me. And so I was yeah. waiting to see, like, it went on a little long without them realizing. Plus, Alice just always seems like she does not know what is going on in her life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she terrible just... power of discernment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know. I and mean, she's we... a journalist. That's I know. The thing. <laughs> like, uh, like a job that, it, you know, she might as well be a cop. Because, like, she's supposed to be, like, have this level of, like, paying attention and solving crimes. But, man, just, like, everything goes on right under her nose all the time at mm -hmm. the yeah. house. She's very aloof. Her character made some weird changes, too, though, between season one and two, I feel like. Because was yeah. it in season oh, one yeah. where she was, like, smudging the house all the time to, like, get rid of bad energies? And then all of a sudden in season two, I feel like she's a completely different person than she was in season mm -hmm. one. Well, in season one, she was writing Betty for everything. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... Still riding her, but not in the same kind of... No, she seemed more absent. Yeah. Yeah, but she was still, like, kind of that crazy helicopter mom. But, yeah. like, still absent and, like, not as direct, I guess. Yeah. Well, let's check in with the young talent this season. So we had KJ Appa and company. Betty was having dark times. Veronica became a full-on mob princess, so that was fun. <laughs> Archie became this go to errand boy was how I phrased it in my questions for lack yeah. of better word. Jughead had a lot on his plate. Cheryl was undergoing conversion therapy. Kevin was looking for dates in the woods. We had <laughs> Midge and Moose and introducing Tony Topaz. Tony Topaz is my biggest girl crush. Like I love her character. I love her storyline. I love that she came in. Mm -hmm. And no spoilers, but she just continues mm -hmm. into the couple next couple seasons just being like yeah. One of the reasons I keep coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Very good addition. Yeah, I liked her. Oh yeah. A lot. Easily. The young, the young talent is just kind of like the reason why I watch it, just because they're my age and like even off screen, like I follow all of them on Instagram and they're just like best friends. They're all just yeah. best friends. So like going into the show, I'm just like, oh, they are actually like friends. They don't hate mm -hmm. each other or anything mm -hmm. like that. So it just kind of brings it more like alive and more real. It's not just like this gloomy. And she's another so. Disney star, Tony Topaz is. She was on My Babysitter's a Vampire. Vanessa like, so Morgan, isn't that her real yep, name? Mm -hmm. Vanessa Morgan. So that was kind of neat because like, her and Cole came from... Or, yeah, Cole. I get my spouse brothers mixed <laughs> up. I'm not going to lie about it. <laughs> this one's Cody. Okay, Cody. Exactly, exactly. Cody. Yeah, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just neat to see like they came from all... And then I also liked the recasting in this season for... Reggie. Reggie. Oh, I love I, yeah. Like, I mean, I love the guy that played him in season one. Don't get me wrong. He was wonderful. But I really feel like where they went with Reggie, this was the perfect casting mm -hmm. for him. No, yeah. I actually... I yeah. do, Even though he, the guy that leaves goes to 13 mm -hmm. Reasons Why, yeah. which we also cover on the CPU <laughs> podcast, <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh -huh. <laughs> I liked the second Reggie mm -hmm. better. Charles Melton, I think. That's Yeah. Yeah. He mm -hmm. I love him. I particularly when we get to season three, like I think he was a fantastic mm -hmm. choice and he just fits in with that whole group so well. Like Gabby was saying, like I follow a couple of them on Instagram and I think it just makes their on screen relationship so much better knowing that like even behind the scenes they're best friends. I think it's really they're yeah. fantastic. They, yeah, and they really do do everything together, like Vanessa Morgan and Cheryl Blossom, whose name Madeline. is Madeline. Madeline. Thank you. Gosh. It like completely <laughs> left my brain for a second there. They do YouTube videos together all the time about like vegan friendly food and like. So it yeah, really is um, a show where they are like a family on set and off. Set. Yeah, Vanessa Morgan, I think, just got married and she had like, almost all of them in her wedding. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like, it's yeah. awesome. I will say though that Camilla Mendez and the guy that plays Reggie now, mm -hmm. we just said his name again. Charles Melton. <laughs> They were dating and broke up, so I am kind of interested on what it's like on set for them now. But it, where did the pussy cat? Where did the pussy cats? They're gone now. Yeah. Well, one of them went to Altered Carbon because I found that out. <laughs> <laughs> I love Val. I'm just missing them. Carbon. I enjoyed them, and yeah. they're gone. They were a nice like adding to. They were their own like nice little fresh. Yeah, air. one of them yeah. was dating Archie for Archie, a hot second, and then the other one. 
Was there too? <laughs> well, and yeah. I and I really enjoy Josie, but uh-huh. it is Josie and the Pussycats, and mm-hmm. so that that was an absence that I felt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From this season forward, basically. But we kind of went away from music now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, that gets alluded much. to in Susan in season three. Somebody even says to him like, "Well, first you were doing this, and then you were." So he's yeah. kind of cycling through, but. But I didn't hate that we kind of got away from that. I think in season one it felt like it was not necessarily unnecessary, but it felt like a little too much fluffy it they were just, trying to get grundy and him to have more reasons I think. yeah, and, yeah. And it felt a little did. forced i it will say though i do like, think uh, yeah. it was a good job, despite <laughs> was like, everything that's been going on this season of kind of fleshing out the the, the b team because we do get a lot more i feel like in the first season kevin was just kind of like here is our LGBT representation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First of all, we have a lot more of that this season, especially oh, yeah. with the conversion therapy story arc. But Kevin gets a lot more depth. We get to see more of the insight to Josie and her mom's relationship, especially in conjunction with Kevin and his and dad. Her mom since, is played uh, by Robin Gibbons. Former Mayor McCoy mm-hmm. and the sheriff are still together, or seeing each other. And yeah, I'll say that I. This season two is probably the time that I like Cheryl the best. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because of the conversion therapy storyline, because you see even further into the whole whatever their estate is called estate. <laughs> Thornhill. Thornhill. Yes, that's it. And just how kind of messed up they really are. And she is very charismatic. She's phenomenal. She's, I think, my favorite. Like, mm-hmm. especially into season three. I think she's my favorite of that whole And bunch. she's an archer now, too. Yeah, I know. Yeah. She's like Robin Hood. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> she's like a sexy Merida. <laughs> she's like Green Arrow. <laughs> But well, she insists like on him. being red. <laughs> I think if you have red hair, you have to learn how to shoot. Right? Like a bow and arrow. Like Girls. Required. Is that how it works? I guess so. Oh, I, don't okay. know. I don't know. I don't know. What about the adults then? Let's get into them. Who likes them? Maybe I, I still love, love the adults. I do too, maybe because they're them. my age now. Not quite. I, I mean, just, I'm a little older. We're, we're the Gen X people. Right. We're old. <laughs> We keep talking about it, but I just think this whole cast as an ensemble yeah. is so strong. There really isn't mm-hmm. anybody There's that I like. There's not been a missed cast at all. No. It's like one of the strongest no. overall casts I think I've ever seen in a show. There's, I don't, I can't think of anybody really off the top of my head that I'm like, ooh, I don't really like that I even much. love the casting as Pop. Like, we don't really, mm-hmm. t- like, he's not, like, a big forerunner, but, like, if I ever went to a place called Pop's Chocolate Shop, like, that's who I would expect to be inside running it. Like, yeah. he just looks... Like, he belongs there. And all the adult casting is amazingly done. Like, they play their characters, and you're sitting there, and you're like, I couldn't. Like, we've been saying, I can't see anybody else playing that character. This foreshadows, but I I actually felt them, feel for them more strongly in the next season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think in this season, they're good. They're always good, but they're still kind of flat. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, in the writing, I think they're... Wow. I Although think Luke, I always love Luke Perry forever. Luke Perry gets really good writing. Oh God. The whole oh, yeah. his whole arc. Oh, I, yeah. I don't oh, think yeah. they they really gave him a lot to do at all times, and I really enjoyed him. And I like him and Molly Ringwald together because even though yeah. they're playing a divorced couple, they still have good dynamics. Yeah, mm-hmm. separated. Um, oh, separated. separated I'm couple. sorry. Thank you, Nate. They are not divorced yet, are they? No. <laughs> no, they. No. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> As we find out later, they yeah, will yeah, never yeah. be divorced. I think that, yeah, when Molly Ringwald walked in for the first time, I literally marked out. I was just like, oh shit, this is it. <laughs> They've done it. Yeah. They hit it so perfectly because, I mean, she was an 80s queen. Oh, and, like, and then to have her play the mom of the all American boy, Archie, who, I mean, in this series, in this timeline, isn't really his, really his moniker, but to have someone like Molly Ringwald to be to bring in there in that weird dynamic that you can actually you get the feeling that they could literally be a family, like just yeah. the way the two personalities of Molly Ringwald and Luke Perry work, and then to see like their product in in Archie, and it's just like you you get taken away from the that's the writing and the acting that they made it believable as a dynamic yeah they cast in terms of not just actors as the adults they cast the like parents and children very well like if you told me that the kellers weren't related or were related to each other i'd believe you like they look like it 
and it just the, the I don't know what kind of acting rehearsal went on before the show started, but there's just like a shared dynamic between oh, yeah. everybody who's in a family unit, especially as chaotic as it is, even the Coopers, like there are through lines to both of the kids in that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, well, exactly. I'm- like sometimes you watch a show and they'll bring in like a celebrity, like an older celebrity to play a parent. And you're just like, oh, how fun to see that person on my TV box. But you don't believe it. And then, but like I said, when even the first time I saw Fred Adbury's back in season one, I was just like, nice. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is that you know, he just looked like a Midwestern dad. And they nailed it. R.I.P. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and so many of the adults, I- I'm not sure about Madge and... Imagine Amic, and I'm not sure about Mark Consuelos or Lachlan Monroe, but every other adult actor was a teen star at some point. Mm-hmm. Imagine Amic was on Twin Peaks. That's not really a teen show. No, but I mean, <laughs> that's I guess I'm saying she was a young act, teen actor. Oh yeah, but yeah. I was thinking like Luke, Luke Perry, and Marcel Nichols are both on Beverly Hills 902 and That's true. Mm-hmm. Molly Ringwald, of course, 80s Brat Pack yeah. movies, Queen, Skeet oh. Ulrich, the Scream franchise. Mm-hmm. I also just Robert watched. Robin Gibbons um, was on Head of the Class. Yes, Robin the Gibbons was on Head of the Class. I just watched The Craft, and he's in that. He is in that. Yeah, and I like I took a picture of it and sent it to my friends. I was like, Oh, F.P. Jones looking hot when he was young. Look, I've <laughs> always had a thing for him. I don't know what it is. In yeah. Scream, I was like, Oh my gosh, I know you're the murderer, but you are smoking. <laughs> See, I, I always, always liked him. Gabby, that's how old I am. Because that was like my, my teen. He was your Cole Sprouse. <laughs> and everybody yeah. said, oh, he's a poor man's Johnny Depp. That's I'm like, what I said. Oh, wait, oh, Johnny Depp is a poor man's Ski Aldrich. <laughs> I will take Ski Aldrich any day. But right. Ski has aged like a fine wine. Fine and wine. I am all right with yeah. that. The <laughs> finest of wine. Yeah. Would you rather go on a date? With Ski Ulrich or Luke Perry. Ooh. Oh. Sorry, like boys. Turn bitch. away, boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. the Luke thing is a little impossible I know, now, but, but it's a dream anyway. We don't know them. I would well, probably go with Luke. <laughs> I would go with Ski. Yeah. Just because I've always kind yeah. of favored that, like, darker hair, bad boy uh-huh. vibe. Uh-huh. I mean, truly, I love redheads, which is why, I mean, I know KJ Appa is not a natural redhead. But that's why I'm like, ooh, God, Archie. <laughs> Gabby doesn't He's have so to pick because she already picked. <laughs> so she gets him. All right, she boys, would you rather go on a date with Veronica <laughs> 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 or Betty? Well, out of the Marcel moms. Nichols oh, or, or Molly Ringwald. Yeah, you can pick the hot moms. moms. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, Mar- I think Marcel Nichols. She's, yeah, she's not know. surprised that's what Micah said. <laughs> <laughs> Ringwald, I don't know. Ringwald, I think she was like super duper successful like back in the 80s. I don't I don't know if we can relate anymore. I don't know if she is as down to earth as I need for my dream date, you know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, I, I felt like that was a I hashtag Molly each Ringwald. <laughs> You're just picking like, Molly? Just like when I met Skippy from Family Ties. Like, I talked so much about 80s bullshit with him i would do the same thing with molly she would probably never talk to me again because <laughs> i would just ask so many things i'd be like so really jed nelson is he's he's nice in person is, is he nice in person you know tell me more but i know that's what i would you know for the for the for the trivia is who is why I would date <laughs> molly if anybody is listening in this cast and wants to go on a date with us now you know <laughs> i'm a single pringle well, hit me well, up yeah. right? let's do <laughs> this <laughs> Tweet right us here. at CPU Podcast and tell us. There's a couple married people. Maybe it should qualify. I mean, it's not like a real It date. could be oh, a friendship not. date. Like, y'all yeah, just go get some sushi and talk about life. Yeah, and right. if you happen to fall in love, you fall in love. <laughs> 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 it, 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 yes, it can definitely yeah. be a group date if that's what makes their parents Great. more comfortable. Just, <laughs> just wrote yeah. the plot line of uh, a whole new Molly TV Ringwald show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jumping back into okay. his show. <laughs> yes. I will say, out of all the adults as far as plot-wise, I think FP's kind of redemption and road to alcoholism recovery is the MVP arc of the season. Agreed. Uh-huh. He, FP, like, my yeah. heart is for... I mean, I love Fred Andrews. Like, out of the dads, Fred and FP are, like, my favorites. But there is just something about FP's storyline that just, like, is in my heart. And I'm like, you got this, FP! 
Go! <laughs> I love his transformation as a dad, we believe though, in too. You. His, his we dad arc you. was even just so great. Like, watching him go from this kind of, like, tough love to, like, here, let me take care of you. Like, I'm protective. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I loved it. Well, and even not just tough love, I feel like he was almost like an absent fa like an absentee father for a little bit, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, didn't he hit John <laughs> Yeah. Well, and he left him alone in season one when, yeah. he, when the drive-in got shut down. He was like, okay, I'm going with the gang. Fend for yourself, kid. And, like, peaced out real quick. Yeah. Well, and that's the, the story that's later told on the other side of the family's coin, mm -hmm. too. So. I will say in terms of, like, we talked briefly about, like, the serpents versus the ghoulies. For me, a lot of the ghoulie stuff, including the presence of Penny, the snake charmer, was just very, like, villainy for villainy's sake. But the thing that kind of bugged me about the serpents in this season is that the leadership very swiftly, like, in terms of, like, who leads the gang being, like, moving to Jughead, and then who are, like, the main people in the gang being the other high school students. Like, this is a full city gang. There are many people who are like in their 30s and older in this gang and then all of a sudden let's let's listen to the 17 year old he's got <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. true exactly. but Jughead yeah. is We've very got a smart. very weird like disney vibe almost with the just how okay everyone was with <laughs> the high schooler because you make a good point when they're in the bar it's like everybody in there is like late forties. They all have, they are all are just like old, like easy rider biker dudes. And then he's just like, "Hey, everybody, it's me, the writer guy, who's FP's <laughs> kid. I'm gonna be the leader now." And they're just like, "All right, let's listen to him." Like, <laughs> you just—it's one of those willing suspensions of disbelief moments where you just like, yeah. "Fine." It was also really <laughs> hard. Go. It was also really hard for me to keep track of all of those names. Like all of the serpent names were so similar but so different, and it was so hard for me to keep track of everybody. I particularly tall guy and sweet pea. Tall, tall, tall boy. boy. Yeah. See exactly. Yeah. <laughs> tall boy. <laughs> it, especially fangs, like fangs. into season three. Like season three, it just like explodes even more and I'm like I don't know who you I don't remember which one you are who are you it kind of they're kind of asking you to suspend disbelief a little bit because mm -hmm. this is a small town but like I've never been in a small town with this many gangs <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as a small town girl we I mean it's northern Michigan small town so maybe that's why but we didn't have gangs <laughs> yeah. we had people that thought they were in gangs <laughs> yeah I mean I'm from a small town Gabby's from a small town those two places are not ramp rampant with gang life I just I mean you know <laughs> bigger town that we're all currently all except for Jessica. I mean, bad enough in, that there's like... a second high school where you have to be in a gang in this high school. <laughs> <laughs> this high school yeah. was like, nobody was teaching anything. If you were, the journalism teacher was bad. It's so like jingle the jangle thing. Jingle jangle yeah. running amok in this yes. high school. Yes, what amok. the F is the jingle jangle? Oh my God. I have pixie it's sticks like, on steroids. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like pixie sticks full of meth. <laughs> that was kind it's of something. <laughs> but it, yeah. I don't understand the drugs and well, and of course the show is the dark side of small town life. But this is a really big dark side. It's a very, really big yeah. dark side in a very big small yeah. town. Yeah. Right. Yes. The number of like like Sarah yeah, was saying the number of gangs. Darkness. Yeah. Also, and they haven't even gone to Greendale yet. <laughs> so. Well, that's that's much more complicated these days. Greendale has its own th stuff going on. Yeah. I know, but oh, but I'm just saying. <laughs> this is totally random, and I can't find it. But this is the season with the red circle, right? Yeah, yes. it is. The red circle and yeah. the black circle. I think there was yeah. a third circle. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I feel like all of a sudden Archie like hit third puberty or something and was like, I have brain! <laughs> like, I get it, his dad was shot. Like, I totally understand. But all of a sudden, Archie was just seeing red because yeah. there was the red circle. <laughs> The black circle. The red hair. How he went after Nick St. Clair later. Like, yeah. oh, that guy. Yeah. That guy oh, right He got it from the girls and Archie. <laughs> yeah. But, no, like, I, I really feel like I forgot about Archie just bowl. ate Rage Cheerios every morning and was like, okay, let's go knock some stuff up. To yeah. be fair, the season did open with his dad being shot I in the know. chest. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I felt like it just, it, like... Dad got shot, he met Hiram, and all of a sudden he was like, I'm a bad boy for life. 
Yeah. Do these kids have any homework? <laughs> they're not doing any coursework ever. I'm sorry. I know I'm a high school teacher, but I don't understand. They're just never doing work. No. Okay. I had to get that out there. I know it's just a show, but I was like, Lord. Like, it's the well, first uh, season. We Riverdale's saw Betty do homework. So, yeah. Yeah. Riverdale's so. a Montessori school. It is a Montessori school. <laughs> You're right, Nate. It has to be. Like, don't be such a square. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Here it is. Ready? Uh oh. No. Uh -oh. So many musical theaters. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm going to name some. <laughs> Sarah's for you. I now. wish they could see her face right now. Hashtag. Hashtag. Right. Sarah's Sarah's people. Didn't know. So Most the librarian was named Mrs. Peru, which mm -hmm. is of course from the Music, music Man. Yeah. Somebody said, "I want to be in the room where it happens." Hamilton. Hamilton. They sang. Or said, I can't remember, but I wrote out tonight, which is Rent. Rent. Yeah. the drag race where she goes, not today, cha-cha. Uh-huh. Grease. Yeah. Uh -huh. My brain stopped again. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Prison number was 24601. Lemons. Mm -hmm. They sang, you'll never walk alone. Oh, oh. what is that one? Oh, I know it's, it, and I'm going to be so I'll let mad. Gabby get one. Harrison. Yes, good job. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> through that one more. They called her, they did say Ava Perone like the Rainbow Tour, which is, of Evita. course, Evita. Evita. They sang Suffering Till Suffrage, which is a schoolhouse rock, but mm -hmm. isn't a musical. Yeah. And, of course, they did carry the musical. You guys, I was dying. <laughs> In I case you didn't it. know, we're musical theater people. Some of us Especially are. Sarah. <laughs> yes. So, okay, musical episodes. There some people like them, some people yeah. don't. What yeah. were your thoughts on this? I loved it. I really did like this one. I was pleasantly surprised because I didn't feel like it was going to fit into the show very well. I was kind of worried at first. Like, yeah, they w were very musical in the first season like Archie and everything but just the overall feel of the show I wasn't sure how that was all gonna like work into it but I was actually pleasantly surprised with how much I liked it and they were able to carry in character issues into the characters they were playing in the show mm -hmm. like if that makes sense because like Betty was I don't remember her character's name Veronica played Chris yeah Sue she was Sue, oh, she was Sue. and it like because yeah. that's when they were kind of at tensions because of the black hood that's why Betty was pushing Veronica away, but it kind of, like, worked because Betty still got to portray this, like, girl next door in Sue. Archie got to portray the boy next door by playing her boyfriend, and then... John Chris, Travolta. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but John the, the sweet movie. boy. <laughs> and then Veronica was Chris, who was this princess and the bad girl, and it kind of just still reflect everything. And I loved the scene where... Cheryl covered herself in blood mm -hmm. and was walking to Thornhill. I just loved all of it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a musical person. <laughs> she says <laughs> sheepishly to her teacher. <laughs> oh, sorry, Gary. Yeah, I did really like this. It was, for like the characters, it was kind of a break from reality and what was happening. You have to bottle episode on a musical episode, though. That's on many different shows. Yeah, I just thought they they were really smart about how they worked it into the show, and like Gabby was saying, it was like kind of a nice reprieve from all of the other crazy stuff that was going on, but still worked into all of that. I thought they did it really well. I was really impressed. I was Googling, obviously, like, are they really singing? And, like, mm -hmm. every single one of them was doing all of it, which For I those of incredible. you who are interested, there is actually a complete soundtrack for mm -hmm. Riverdale, oh, okay, the yeah. playlists of which are available on Spotify. Oh, and nice. I will Play. link to the website. If you have Google Play, it's on there as mm -hmm. well. You can also listen to them on Amazon Music. <laughs> <laughs> so we're an See. equal opportunity, non-sponsored affair. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you if it's on Apple Music. Music. What okay. I liked was they clearly, okay, so I knew there was going to be a musical episode before I watched it because Emily told me, which I'm not mad about, but they were clearly <laughs> dropping this little trail of breadcrumbs with all these musical references, mm -hmm. and I know I seem mm -hmm. like a mega geek. I was writing them down because I knew Everybody's I was moderating, got their thing. but <laughs> other people were picking those I, up too, right? I totally I mean, picked them up, especially them, the yeah. Miss Peru. That one was like, what? Is this Peru? <laughs> yeah, but I, what I really liked then is when they got to the musical, I'm not a huge fan of Carrie the musical. I know that's... Yeah. Yeah. got a huge cult following. I don't really, I know like three songs, but it, they picked a musical that fit into the the to the horror theme yep. and this little musical theme that they were adding in. And I loved how Cheryl was going to play Carrie. She's not a good choice for Carrie, but 
she nope. wanted that and then was replaced by Midge, who was then murdered on stage, so that kind of ruined it. Yeah, yeah, I just, I want to echo this. I am not a fan of Carrie the Musical at all. As a fan of the original book and also the original movie, I think that is one of the worst adaptations to the oh, stage. Yeah. Hands down. Oh, yeah. I've only yeah. ever listened to it. I've never seen it. Yeah. It's but... not done much because it opened on Broadway and I think was canceled before Act 2 was even going on. Like, okay. during Act 1, yeah. they were like, shut this nonsense down. Well, then it's they did a, a bunch yeah. of yeah. they did a bunch of rewrites and then it never reopened again right. and that's no. like what's been licensed to like community right. theaters and high schools and stuff to do it but it's like really poorly written. Yeah. It's like really not great. I saw it when one of the local theaters here did it and I was like this script is not good. Yeah, the book is not good. However, I agree with what you just said, Sarah. I think mm -hmm. for the theme on the season, for the fact that they had literally a perfect Carrie type character but she in reality Cheryl's much more like Carrie's mom in the book yeah <laughs> so I thought that was a nice little touchstone that they were able to weave in I'm glad that they didn't sing all the songs from the musical yeah mm -hmm. I'm glad that they tied it into the plot I mean I think the one they do later is much, much better, and I'll explain oh. why when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> but this one I thought was fairly interesting, although I did post on Facebook after watching it, well, I've reached the musical portion of Riverdale. <laughs> <laughs> so. I did, the only weird thing about all of it, and I get why they did it now, was casting Alice instead of another high school yeah. student yeah, that as the mom. A little weird. But that got hey, all there, hey. yep. and you it can, got you it can, so you can have could adults play adults. In high school shows, I remember I was in a production of Fame once upon a time, and we happen to have two people that are on the panel right now. Matt, you're, you're really Matt, outing Matt, our Matt, age right stop now. Stop doing that. That uh, was me and Kylie, listeners. It wasn't the original production of Fame, like it was. Not that, not that. So we knew my company was in high school. I don't know what Fame is because I'm super young. Oh, you're so. lucky. You're lucky. Girl. I'm totally lying. I know what Fame. Over. Fame, also yeah. not the best musical adaptation <laughs> no, no. of a movie, but yet... Better than Carrie. Yeah. Better than yeah. Carrie. <laughs> Better than Carrie. Yeah, it does happen, actually, but that they were reaching with that one. Mm -hmm. But like we, like I was saying with her, was that... Well, well, with Emily, sorry. They can't see that I'm pointing to Emily. <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, but like I was just saying to Emily, like, it makes sense because it gets Hal in the audience yeah. as an audience mm -hmm. member, so you're thrown off of his track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, mm -hmm. yes, Midge gets murdered unfortunately but he's in the audience with betty so you're like well he couldn't have done it because when was he on stage he was sitting next to his daughter the whole time so yeah i get why they did it but at the same time at first i was like why but poor midge isn't she one of the original comics characters i think so and she also she already yeah. almost got murdered in the in car, the car. Yeah. yeah so she was probably like boy i yep. sure escaped that nonsense no you're dead no. Yeah, was... <laughs> Look at me. I'm the lead in a high school play. My life is sure turned around, said Midge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a river vixen and I'm Carrie. What more could happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, Midge. That, that was a great plot twist, though, too. That was definitely not something I uh -huh. saw coming. I was like, oh, they're not going to kill. Like, it's a musical episode. It's going to be, like, happy and fun. And then I was like, oh, never mind. Well, and I thought at first maybe it was, yeah. like, a prank. Could mm -hmm. be, like, maybe they were trying to scare people into thinking the Black Hood had done something. But then yeah. Cheryl said something along the lines of, like, she needs help. Get her help. And I was like, oh, oh, this oh. is not, this is not a trick. She is yeah. dead. She is dead. <laughs> Yeah. She She's did. big dead. <laughs> she did. Oh, also, speaking of dead. Got the, the, the C team of characters, we got the actor who played Chuck coming back from filming Black Lightning to <laughs> be Chuck again. And yeah. he was just like, hey, I don't want to be a bad guy anymore. And everybody was like, cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. That's what musicals are for. <laughs> we forgive you for exploiting women. <laughs> And so, that's how it works. Join a musical and all is forgiven. I mean, well, sometimes. So, <laughs> um, so one of the more controversial plot points from season one involved Archie having an affair with his music teacher, Geraldine Grundy, played by Sarah Habel. Things did not end well for her. What did you make of this, and was this as horrifying for you to watch as it was for me? <laughs> horrifying, yes, but for different reasons. I think, because yeah. you knew her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, like... I kind of thought she was just going to be an afterthought, to be completely honest. Like, she left. I was like, okay, we're never going to see Mrs. Grundy again. Mm -hmm. And then she's killed with the violin bow that Archie gave her. <laughs> 
And I was like, that's twisted. But like, it made sense when you found out why the Black Hood was doing what he was doing. Like she sinned in his eyes by being with an underage person. So yeah, it was, it was weird. I was sad because I was like, I kind of thought she was just gonna ride off in the sunset with her heart-shaped glasses and Slurpee and live happily ever after. See, I actually thought we were gonna see her again for a longer period. That's mm -hmm. what I thought too. I was surprised that this yeah. happened so quickly. Yeah. And that she was yeah. the first victim. That seemed a little bit weird to me because it was like, were the Coopers really dialed into that? Technically yeah. she was the second victim. Oh, was because she the second he victim? Because he had shot Fred already. Oh, right, exactly. And Fred yeah. lived, but he had shot Fred on the right. The first death, yeah. then. Yeah. 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 I, I the first had hoped, murdered victim. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I had hoped that we would, that she would have kind of disappeared a little bit for the beginning longer than the first couple episodes, and then we would have seen her be a little later in the season. I think that would have been a stronger, like, more gut punch sort of thing, been like, oh, crap like I totally forgot about her and I forgot like I think that would have been a stronger choice but hey I'm not a writer on the show <laughs> and I just right. wanted Sarah well, to get more more of that money yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm sure she did too <laughs> it was basically because I watched season one and two in a binge you know like it was all screaming by then so I didn't think to myself like oh man somebody had to wait a long time from the end of season one to season two and be like, what? This is a surprise for me. I was just like, oh, there's Miss Grundy again, who I just saw five episodes ago. And then, oh, she's been murdered. You know, like when you binge, that also gives you a different way you watch the characters develop because it's so quick versus where you have that break by watching it in real time. Her murder was very, like, graphic and mm -hmm. slow yeah. and, like, horror yeah. movie esque. A lot of time it's spent yeah. on. Yeah, but even. Don't worry, to, like... she's really dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But even compared to the other Black Hood murders, like that one was pretty gruesome. And I feel like really like intimate in a way too, because like he like had to hold her against him and like be there for Lift every her up second. The ground, of it. Yeah. And to joke with yeah. the other ones, like, well, with a lot of the other murders that the Black and... Hood did, it was we see the results or we see an attempt. True. We don't usually see the attempt and a finished result. Like, we see yeah. him shoot Fred, we see him shoot Moose, but they both lived. Whereas, like, Midge, who is dead, we don't see her get yeah, she, attacked. We don't see her get killed. But yeah. with Miss Grundy, it's like start to finish the full murder process. So, that was, yeah, it's a little more in depth. Yeah. They might have been testing yeah. the waters because season three gets a lot more graphic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just feel like they maybe were, because of the horror theme and stuff like that, that was kind of their homage to something. You know, it was kind of almost, it wasn't in the shower, but it had hints of Psycho. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kylie teased our interview with Sarah Habel, but she does talk a little bit about, about it, about filming that scene. So listen, so stay tuned, you. listeners. I do want to say with Hal... I mean, this was definitely the season of breakups. Like, so many different pairs were joining and splitting and rejoining. But Hal's arc, just like non-murder, he got, he gets kicked out of the house because of his attitude towards Chick, which, bringing a murderer aside, he actually was on the right side of that one. Uh -huh. Like, good on you, Hal. Not trusting Chick. Good job. And then he is shacking up with Penelope Blossom for a little bit. And I just yeah. thought it was strange that the murders just kind of stopped around then. Like, I would assume if you were a murderer and then you were having a relationship with Penelope Blossom, she would only make you more murdery, just of how I have gauged her personality. But is, she, I guess, like, she seems to appease him in some way. Which is also creepy well, because like, he's related uh, to the Blossoms on the other side. Oh, yeah, that's, that's that's his cousin's wife, right? Gross. Is that yeah. what it was? She's got to have gonorrhea. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it was his cousin, <laughs> right? Like Steph's, she's like adopted sister. Because remember, they adopted her to groom yeah. her to be his wife. That's, that's right. the one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, that's the one. Well, because she's like a whore. But it's a a literary one. I don't she mean starts yeah. that this season. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not calling her permission. She's she a sex literally worker. takes money. Yes. Thank you. That's the, <laughs> that's the PC way to say that. And to be clear, she seems to really like her job. Yeah. I mean, she does. She's like, this is great. I would like to be 
Yeah. Amanda. Yeah. yeah. She's um, one of those characters that, like, I never know what to expect with Penelope Blossom. Like, yeah. she'll be really loving oh, yeah. and caring one episode, and the next episode, she's like, I have to go meet my gentleman caller now. Be gone, child. Okay. All right. <laughs> Speaking of randomly predictable Blossom business, why did we need Clifford to have a twin? <laughs> Yeah, that was so weird. Maybe they just like, like but, the actor. No, well, they... Know. That's what I thought. But they also had... I. It makes sense, though, because Jason and Cheryl were twins. Like, I, I didn't hate it as much as I as right. I should. Just twins because it made family. sense, like, knowing that twins run in the family, because then Polly had twins. So, like, mm-hmm. I, it was believable. I thought it was a little weird. It's but very like, flowers in the attic. <laughs> the whole family. Yeah. It's Which very is DC. technically kind of horror-y. No, it is. Yeah, it's it's a gothic core. They call gothic it. Core. But it's very VC Andros. I yeah. love VC Andros in high school. Who didn't? <laughs> right. I was that kid in high school that always had one of her books. <laughs> <laughs> We kind of touched on Jingle Jangle, but, you know, we got Jughead and Archie. They're like drug runners now. Penny's a drug linchpin. What? What? Why? I think the poor Jughead was like, I don't want to do this. And Archie's like, come on, let's do this. And he's like, oh, fine. <laughs> so, Nailed it. <laughs> I mean, does that does that just go along with gangs like drugs, gangs? I mean, it's kind of that's tied in. Drugs called Jingle Jangle doesn't. <laughs> Sounds yeah. Christmassy. I bet it's peppermint meth. Ooh, <laughs> peppermint. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, see, but if they say that in school, the cops will come. But they can say Jingle Jangle, and people don't know what they mean. Yeah, that's okay. It just so keeps very good product name, but not. Oh not yeah, good for it's, 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 it's really viral. on brand. They did a really great job with branding there. Powdered candy drug. Yeah. <laughs> It is you can talk about it all day in school, and the parents will never be the wiser. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not very many teachers, so I don't think... I, say, I think we see the principal, the office, like, secretary. The music maybe teacher, a teacher got killed. I think we see a classroom teacher, like, once or twice. But I mean, like, it's like the kids are directing the musical, too. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, to yes. be fair, my yeah. high school, we did do a, one student-ran show a year. So yeah. maybe Carrie maybe was their student ran show, and look what happens when you let students run shows. <laughs> <laughs> they die. Murder. <laughs> Murder. Season two, you guys, it ended with a cliffhanger of Archie getting arrested for Cassidy's murder. Cassidy was the guy in the small town near the big resort or the big log cabin that oh, yeah, yeah. Veronica's yeah. family owns and he was like came to rob them and whatever and then he ran it out and Archie saw him get murdered but now he got arrested for the murder so did this leave you hanging well it made me mad like <laughs> I was mad. <laughs> I think you're the only one of us, though, that watched it in real time. Like, I, I did. Know. I did watch it in real time. <laughs> because binge-watching it, I was not <laughs> I was not left hanging because I just watched the first episode of the third season right away. As a real-time watcher, I was left hanging and very confused. But also, I was like, well, you don't mess with Hiram Lodge. Like, you yeah. step out of line yeah. and he's going to make your life miserable. It was less impactful to me than shooting Fred. Yeah. I yeah. couldn't remember who it was, so I was like, who? <laughs> yeah. Who? Who that? <laughs> yep, I did the same thing. Yeah. I was like, like even just now when you said it, I was like, wait, which one was he? <laughs> I didn't remember yeah. that one. I think that worked I in the plot up. device's favor, though, that we, like, especially if you were someone who was watching the episodes week by week, you would probably, like, forget, cause so, because we resolved the entire Black Hood arc in mm-hmm. between Cassidy being a character and then Archie getting arrested. So, yeah, you're going to forget about him. So then when Hiram is, like, making this threat to Archie, you wonder, what are you going to do? And then it's that. And you're like, that is sneaky, and I hate you for it, sir, but well done. Yeah. What left me hanging more is what happened to Jughead. What happened to Jughead? I had again? to look back. He got, <laughs> Penny got him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do not like, like Penny. That yeah. left me nope. hanging and gave me more of a Fred feeling mm-hmm. than yeah. Archie getting arrested. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was kind of like, oops, sorry, yeah. Archie, like, whatever. I didn't like Archie as much in season two as much as I did in season one. Agreed. Season two, Archie was, yeah. like, kind of bland. You didn't and, like, like his meh. Cheerio rage fuel. <laughs> no, <laughs> that was really annoying, actually. Yeah. I mean, he has yep. a very nice yeah. visage yeah. to look oh, at, God, yeah. but at the same time, yeah, Archie, 
I, I get I get what they're trying to do, take Archie kind of the furthest down the rabbit hole because mm -hmm. he's iconically the face of the comics and is yeah. the all-American teenager and does a bunch of stuff. But at the same time, that his journey, even though it's all downhill, is an uneven downhill. Yeah. It's like riding a sled and hitting rocks on the way down. Yeah. I also feel like a lot yeah. happened in this finale. Like, because I just went back because I watched them so close together rewatching them. There's just a lot that happens in this finale. There's the Jughead thing. Archie gets arrested. The Black Hood gets revealed. <laughs> the Black yeah. Hood gets revealed. Mm -hmm. Hermione is crown, crowned. Crowned. Oh, elected. 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 <laughs> elected. Whoa. Mayor, like, the White Worm is taken over by Hyde. Like, there was so much that happened in this yeah. finale. Mm -hmm. That I think it, that's another thing that takes away of the shock of Archie getting arrested. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, back to Archie, though. I wasn't... I didn't love him. He, for me, this season, he was very, it just felt really forced and very, con like, I just didn't love it. I think season three Archie, I much prefer. I think they, it was almost like they were setting it up for season three, but didn't set it up very well. And I think he's kind of back on the upswing of me enjoying him as a character in season three. I have a four-year consideration. Okay. Because he spent much of season three separated from Veronica. Who is who is pro that relationship? No, no. no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I That's thought it what I'm saying. I thought it was weird from the very beginning. I was like, oh, I don't, oh, like I don't mind it. I mean, in the comics, they, do... they switch back and forth. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it's like this Veronica and this Archie. Mm -hmm. I'm not feeling it. No, I am for. But I've always been a Betty and Archie. Like, don't get me wrong, I love Betty and Jughead. Mm -hmm. But like secretly, like deep down in my heart, I am just pulling for Betty and Archie. Yeah. Oh, that'd be yeah. weird. I don't like that. <laughs> But I think, like, my brain is still comic book Betty and Archie. Not necessarily Lily Reinhardt and KJ Appa Betty and Archie, but that nostalgia is why I'm like, come on, do I it. always wanted him to be with Veronica because <laughs> she has brown hair, and I feel like everybody picks blonde people, so I was like, whatever. What's funny is I'm a brunette, so I should be on that team you should with be. you. But Get I on just... our team. <laughs> See, I have the added benefit of not reading the Archie comics so for me like this show is, that is like though? I know right it's like is it a benefit I think it's a benefit in discussing the show because it's like a different it's side of it like, to I, you, it's yeah. totally like, less baggage I, yeah, mm -hmm. I just I had no concept of what was happening in the in the comics and didn't have anything to compare it to. So I think that's I, I read a little bit of the comics just here and there, mostly when stuck in long grocery lines and you know the little <laughs> Archie comic thing is right there by the rack, and I just read a little oh, bit sure. while we were waiting. But I like this Veronica far far better than the one in the comics personality wise. She's yes. not nearly as shallow, I think, and she has more dimension. Agreed. But I will say, by the end of, spoilers, by the end of the Archie-Veronica relationship, I was very much in favor of it coming to a close. I think it ran its course. And mm -hmm. the only reason that Archie got into all of the super dark, mobby stuff this season was because it was Veronica's family and he was trying to yep. like not have that come between them. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I hated all of that. I thought it was all so annoying. I hated that he was acting like this Aaron boy for Hiram. I thought it was just, it just got so tedious. I was like, really? Like, come on. Agreed. I hated how many times we had to hear the words, Papa Poutine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fun fact, poutine is a Canadian dish that is yeah. fries, gravy, and mozzarella so cheese. Good. Of course we know that. We're from Michigan. <laughs> yeah. I grew up Boston. Second Canada. Yeah. Right. And don't Southern let people Canada. from Jersey lie to you. It's not disco fries. It's poutine. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'll get off my soapbox now. That's all right. <laughs> but in terms of the Veronica versus Betty thing, I, I've ne I never have had a horse in that race and the comics version I didn't care but in this version I think it would actually be worthwhile at some point to explore that dynamic now with the characters the way they are because Archie and Betty are in many ways it's not an accident that two of the characters have dark hair <laughs> and two of the characters don't and they've mixed them up up until this point in the TV version of this story the, the fair-haired characters are the ones taking, in some ways, the darkest tumbles. Mm -hmm. They're coming from the highest point to the lowest point, whereas Jughead and Veronica are navigating the middle around an already morally questionable 
set of circumstances. Yeah. I think it would be interesting to see what happens if things get shaken up down the line. Not saying, I don't know what happens in season four. I'm just yeah. saying from season two's vantage point, that's how I felt. Yeah. There's another parallel there because Veronica and Jughead, as much time as they don't seem to spend with each other in the show, like they never really have their own Jughead and Veronica adventures, they both came from families who, in one way or another, were dealing with dark things. Jughead, obviously, because he was living on the impoverished, disenfranchised side of town where the gangs are rampant. And then Veronica, with all of the corruption that her father volunteered for, she could have had a very nice life if he hadn't done all that stuff. But they kind of like have grown up with darkness always in the periphery, whereas Archie and Betty were very much the quintessential small town, all American kids who have kind of had this dark material encroach on what they thought their hometown was. And they've kind of had to come to grips with the whiplash of, of that. We have two questions left. I'm going to wrap them together here. So you need to rank your interest in this show as far as season two is concerned. <laughs> so pretend you're not, don't think ahead. <laughs> one to five stars, one being low, five being high. And then since this is a catch up miniseries, the show's currently in season four. Will you continue to watch the show? So we're going to go around. Tell me your ranking, one to five stars, and will you continue to watch? I'm a solid four right now. I really enjoyed this season, it wasn't my favorite. But, you know, I wouldn't think it's horrible. And I, of course, will continue watching because of my love of Riverdale and Archie and the shenanigans. I remember when I finished watching season two, when I watched the finale of season two, I was like, oh my god, like, I need to watch season three right now. So, for season two, I definitely was like a four and a half, five, like, let's go. I will continue watching it. I watched season three, and I will watch season four. But yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm probably a four, just because it's like one of my favorite shows, but also <laughs> this season wasn't my favorite. You're going to keep watching? Oh, yeah. 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 I am already. <laughs> You're in <laughs> real time watching. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As far as what I remember from season two, I think I was at a solid five, just because while season one was more steady and like I think better put together because it was like a new and complete story they brought in. The highs for season two for me were way better than anything from season one. Like when season two was good it was phenomenal and I was like completely wrapped they had me wrapped around their little finger so it was five stars for me and yeah I will keep watching. I mean I've, I've, I've watched worse shows for longer <laughs> just out of <laughs> yes. loyalty to finishing them off. So mm-hmm. I'm definitely still invested. I agree with Micah. I was I was very hooked. I'd give it a four. Last season, season one, I gave a five. I did have some problems musically. Some of the score they used, like I, I pointed out about how I didn't like the chick music, some of the, some of the character choices. But all in all, yes. I obviously, fourth dimensionally speaking, will continue to watch as I also watch season three. I would give season two a three and a half. I don't remember what I said last time, but I'm pretty sure I was in the threes then too. I probably will always be that for Riverdale, just because now that I'm into it and I know what I like and what I don't like, there there are things that I like about the show. I think Micah highlighted the ones, the parts of it that I liked the best. And we've kind of talked about the parts of it that I've liked the best. But there are also some things that re- it bothers me that they spend 22 episodes on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. Which is standard CW, but and I said that's not going to change. That means that there's always going to be things I struggle with with this show. That isn't to say that I necessarily wouldn't watch it, but without this podcast, it's one of those ones that I wouldn't prioritize. But I do because I produce this podcast, so of course I'm going to continue to watch. (laughs) Fair enough. I'm going to give it a solid four. I enjoyed it while I was watching it. Actually, this one went by pretty quickly. Like, it was easy for me to watch it pretty quickly. I will continue to watch because I am moderating this podcast, (laughs) and I don't have a choice. Although, (laughs) I don't hate watching it. It's hard to, this one's hard for me to binge because it's so dark that I just am like, oh, I'm going to watch The Office now for a couple minutes. (laughs) Is there anything else you want to mention that was not covered? I mean, I don't think it was super important, but Sheriff Keller stopped being Sheriff Keller and a new sheriff came in. Who will the new sheriff be? (gasps) No one say. (laughs) Spoilers. Because that's for... That's season three. The next episode. Yes. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Kylie for our little finale. 
for our level finale, well, I'm going to thank Sarah for moderating, Gabby, Emily, Jessica, Nate, and Micah for joining us to talk, but we're not done yet. If you continue listening, you're going to hear a fabulous interview with Sarah Hagel, so the credits will follow that. Hello, listeners. Sarah here with Kylie. Hi. And we're going to talk to Sarah Habel. She is a graduate of Michigan State University, where she studied acting and theater performance. She has spent time abroad in England, where she worked in children's theater. She has performed in various (laughs) television and film projects, including Whip It, directed by Drew Barrymore, Cold Case, and my personal favorite, Party Down. Sarah was also a cast member on MTV's Underemployed and Rush on USA. We are talking to Sarah today because she plays Geraldine Grundy on Riverdale. And this podcast episode is all about Riverdale. So, hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, friends. Hello. Hello. Nice to be joining you. Thanks for joining us. We like to talk about dynamics. So, how do you know me? (laughs) Oh, Sarah. Sarah and I go way back. We were... Well, maybe at first we were rivals because we were up for the same part in Evita. Oh um, yeah, who, the mistress who got that part? In Evita. Sari, she she can never stop running it, rubbing it in. She got the part. I did. Right? I was just a lonely freshman, and and my dreams did not come true. But that's okay. She was amazing, and I'm I'm. We became friends afterwards because you know there's no denying Sari. She's just. Wait, do we call you Sari still, or are you nope, Sarah now? You nobody know, does, now. but you are welcome to. A couple people do. Megan and Margaret still do, and my friend Jeff, and my stepmom, but you can call me. Hey, That's all those the... people, if you're listening. Hi, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Well, I'm going to call you Sari, because I just can't stop. It's too cute. Yeah, that we met when, when we were in college. We were roommates briefly. Remember that? We did long walks around the campus talking about our feelings. Mm-hmm. If you want to mention oh. the campus, I'll permit you to do that. So Kylie <laughs> went to U of M, but Sarah and I okay. are Spartans. We went to MSU. So Correct. there's mm-hmm. no rivalries here. We're just going to get along. Yes. yes. It's okay. And yeah, I, that's what the world needs. Yeah, I want to point out that I was friends with you mm-hmm. during Evita because you brought me dinner. Like, from the dorm, from the calf to go, you were so nice. And I was like, this is the nicest person. And you were beautiful. And really, honestly, you made out better in that situation because you were in all the scenes and I was in, like, one scene. So, you win. Oh, no, because then you, you came back in the end and you were very haunting and your voice was just yeah, I, I, yeah. insanely good. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I can feel the love tonight. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so... <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the casting process for Riverdale. Like, how did you get the script, or did your agent call, or what happened? My manager sent me the script with an appointment and said, Miss Grundy, on the breakdown, and I was like, Grundy? Really? Because I only knew the comic strip as it was peripherally. I didn't, I, but I did know that Miss Grundy is this white haired lady with a bun who goes around shouting at everyone. I was like, okay, well, I know I'm getting older, but I didn't think I was. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, but then I read the script and it was like, oh, so we're going here. So yeah, the I, I loved the script when I read it. It was so such an interesting mashup of genre that I was like, this is cool. And the casting director, David Rappaport, is somebody I've, I've known for a while and I'm always happy to see him. So it was I was just used to go in. I went in and to a, a room full of there were other Grundies and there were some some Kevins in there, and I think it was just Grundy's and Kevins. But just looking around the room, I was like, okay, okay. Everybody had such a different idea of what this this version of Miss Grundy would be because it's sort of like an un, it, it's an archetype in the comic strip, but then not like since it's been reimagined, it's so different. So there were so many different takes. There was like a hippie Grundy in there. There was like like a really dolled up Grundy in there, and I went super preppy, sort of like very very uptight sort of tense closely wound that was just kind of my my read on it it was the casting directors themselves were so supportive and wonderful and one of the producers was in the room too and that was it and I just left it feeling like okay this was this was a good one and I got the call like I think maybe the next day that it was like okay you got the part you got to fly to Vancouver (laughs) it's time to go it was just that quick I, I wonder if, kind of like, overwhelming. do you think your take, well, I mean, I'm sure it did, but it kind of drove the final product, because, like, your Miss Grundy had, like, the frilly blouses, but they were kind of high neck. Like, you were wearing a cardigan, and, like, 
Yeah, that I was always pushing for that in in wardrobe. I was like, no, let like I didn't want to. I wanted to really. I feel like that that's the instinct a lot of the times is to like capitalize on you know whatever beauty you possess. And I felt really interested in in Grundy being just like so inward that she's not trying to to do that. But then also there's the other side that that she she has both she contains both of those ideas within her. So you were a little familiar with the Archie universe, but not like too... I like seen it, maybe read a few things here and there, but I wasn't yeah a huge aficionado. So when did you kind of find out that that was what it was going to be? Like when you was it when you got the first couple episodes? Like scripts? How does it work? I don't know. Like, yeah. Well, we did the pilot. Do you mean how? How did it? How did I find out that it was going to be like this sort of torqued out version of of Archie? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just reading the pilot, it was just so. It was like Twin Peaks meets yeah. Archie. Yeah. Which I thought was so interesting and almost like I was like, "Come on, this isn't going to work." <laughs> I was like, "How? How, does, how do they manage this?" It feels so, like, just the image you have of Archie is so bubblegum, you know? How does it turn dark like that? Like, how do those two sides meet? And it just, the the director, Lee Krieger, was amazing. Like, he just knew how to access that youthful thing, but also the the dark atmosphere. It was, he just nailed it. So, just reading the script, I guess, to answer your question, the, the pilot script. I, I had a feeling that it was going to go this way, but I didn't know how it was going to go for my character. So you didn't know, like, the full arc going into it? I did not. I was like, I remember walking into rehearsal and being like, do we love her? Do we hate her? Who, you know, I, I had my ideas, but I thought at first, like, I, I should play this villain. Like, she's a villain. And and the, the initial direction was like, no, she's, you know, she's got, she just really loves him. And so that's how we that's how we pushed forward with it at the beginning. But then it started to turn in on itself and get pretty icky in there <laughs> with Grundy. It did. I mean, it was, your character kind of had two different sides to her, right? So did you yeah. did you re- relate to either of those sides, or did you like the young summer Miss Grundy more than like the school mm-hmm. cardigan wearing Miss Grundy? I feel like something changed for her when. She heard the gunshot, you know? Yeah. So, like, maybe she was more summer fun Grundy. Also, can we just, for once, refer... I, I had an idea that if she had a rap name, it would be Young Grundy. <laughs> That's what I, I asked my castmates to please refer to me as. So, Young Grundy. Yeah, I think she, I think that the the whole experience of, of hearing the gunshot and then Jason being dead sort of started to whip her up. And I think she had some like some pretty serious anxiety that started to set in and started to like make her crazy so I think if I relate to anyone it would probably be Summer Grundy because I haven't heard any gunshots recently and I think of myself as a little bit more carefree than than she wound up being. One of our panelists Jessica wanted to know what it was like to kiss KJ Appa. (laughs) She's a great fan of the show and him. (laughs) She was like and that was her question. I mean yeah well I mean, he's a perfect gentleman. He's just the <laughs> sweetest person in, like, people say this, but it's true. Like, he's just the nicest human being in the whole world. And he was so young when the show started. He was 18. So I felt, like, this immense sense of, like, I just wanted to, like, make sure he felt <laughs> comfortable. I was like, you know, I'm 30. <laughs> like, I just wanted, like, wait, so double, no, not quite double age, but, you know, I just wanted to make him feel comfortable, and it was, it was sweet, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that she would dream of, but that's just because I was awkward. <laughs> you look way older me, than 18, I think. For me, those kinds of kisses are always, like, just super awkward, like, the more intense it is, the more comical it like the more intense it's meant to look on screen the more comical it really is because i just can't <laughs> with the cameras and the and the microphone and the lips and all the things did you have a favorite scene to shoot that you shot in either season i really loved once once she started to sort of turn a little dark the scene in the in the music room when She's convincing him to 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 be to stay quiet and not go to the cops or the principal. Yeah, there was like this moment with the hands. There there was this part like where it's just like a very I'm very subtly reaching out with my hand, and I felt 
in that scene, like he and I were so connected and I felt that I, I almost felt like a puppet master. <laughs> like I, this character who, who is, who is sort of meek was completely in control. And that was a good one for me because it's, it's always fun to be in charge. Well, it's such a juxtaposition because I know you said that KJ is like the nicest person, but I always say that about you because I think, (laughs) I mean, you really are one of the nicest people I've ever met and it's kind of not fair that you're so beautiful and talented and nice, but you are, you're so nice. So to watch you, I will not. So to watch you do like those darker things is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think for me, because I know you kind of, but I really like the scene in the car where you're like first seeing him and you're driving by and with the, you have the sunglasses on and. Oh guys. Yeah, the sunglasses. I had to wear, I had to learn how to, how to drive a stick shift for that, which I had no idea what What? I was doing. I was like trying not to hit that hot young actor with my car. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It was tricky. That was, no, that was a, that was a fun one. Cause yeah, if there was any moment in, in. Any of the scripts where I felt most like myself, that would have been it. Because I was just like, hey, you know, like to, to have all that lightness and freedom because the rest of it is heavy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you shoot everything up in Vancouver? Was it all? Everything was in Vancouver. What was that like? <laughs> is it? Well, so Rush... The show I did on USA shot in Vancouver as well. So, I mean, it's a beautiful city. It's It's kind of haunting, like in the winter months or late fall months and it's it gets dark really early and there's the water and the mist in the mountains it, it's like it's a good setting for the for that yeah show. and it's beautiful there so it looked also beautiful. like I left my kid for the first time when she was two when I went for the first time so it was really strange mom vacation mm-hmm. for me to, to be away from her did you watch your character's murder I did not watch my character's murder I did not. I didn't want to see it. <laughs> it's uh, Can I just let it's you know so that's real. a smart decision? It was very upsetting for me to watch it. And yeah, I know it's yeah, not unexpected. real. Unexpected. That whole season two arc was very unexpected. Yeah, season two unexpected. had some craziness. Mm-hmm. So what was it like to film that? Like, is it not scary because there's so many people around and you know it's coming? Or do you, like, really get into it and feel scared? Or I mean, there is going to be an element of surprise. And it is, like, there, there are physical, like, you... It's not completely safe. There's always the stunt coordinator there, you know, leading and guiding and making sure that everything is safe. There's a heightened element of physicality there. So it it was heightened for me. And just sort of knowing, because this was such a, it was such an amazing opportunity to be on the show. So to know that this was the end, it was kind of sad, you know, it's like, okay. It's a, it's a nice, strong ending to something that was so meaningful to me to be a part of. Yeah. I know it is sad because we want you back. Maybe a memory. You sequence? never know. Yeah, I don't know. Or a twin dream sequence. Maybe Grundy has a twin. Yeah, and that, that comes back so to avenge her death. That would be or, great. I don't know. Do you want me to write in? Something. Is there someone? <laughs> do you have an email? I could just quick. <laughs> no, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Who was playing the killer? Was that like a just a stunt person? Stunt, yeah, stunt person. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I always want to know, like, what's going on behind the scenes. I'm just weird like yeah. that. And actually, the, the feet that you see dangling in my scene were not my feet. They, those were a stunt woman's feet. I cannot take credit for those toes. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. I liked those I did shoes. get a pedicure, but, I can't, but they were not my toes. She was wearing shoes. Yeah, she was. Oh, she was? Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, I remember... I remember it being a big deal because I got a pedicure beforehand. See, this is why I didn't watch the scene because I didn't want to <laughs> no, no, no. I just thought um, the shoes were cute. I watched all the rest of it, but just that scene, I was like, no. Yeah, I don't blame you. It was disturbing. Mm-hmm. We all kind of want to know what Luke Perry was like in real life. Did you? Yeah, right, guys? Yeah. I mean, come on. That is the million dollar question. <laughs> I soon. mean, I know I already said this about KJ. I feel like Luke Perry is KJ in however, you know, 25 years. If he was just like. He knew every transpo, makeup, hair, costume, everyone's name. He, like, shook everybody's hand all the time. You touched him? So warm. Like, if there was a job, if there was a job of just, like, being the most immaculately kind person on a set, like, the most professional, like, always so aware of the other actors and the other crew and the people that he was working with, like, just 
with with his background, he could have come up and been like a real jerk because he was such you know hot shit. But mm-hmm. he just he just wasn't. He was just, and it was just really bizarre to meet him because we all grew up watching Beverly Hills Nine Two One Zero. Yes, I was yeah. like, what? Like Perry, I don't know about KJ, but like Luke. What? Yeah, it was really, it was really, I'm really glad that I got to know him. When we got the, the scripts came out and we got the one where, where my death scene was, he called or texted me actually and was like, hey, <laughs> just want you to know we all, we all just appreciate you so much and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he was really Aww. like just the kindest. That's amazing. Yeah, the- so he was texting you. Do you keep in contact with anybody else from the show or? Not really. I mean, like my my life right now is so small. It's like parenting, and that's that's about it. I have sort of taken a step back from the from that world, but I dream about those guys. Yeah. <laughs> They're often in my dreams, and I'm so happy. For- Actually, I spoke to Lily briefly a couple months ago, but yeah. They're just, they're just like skyrocketed, all of them. And they're, I mean, can we just talk about for a minute how perfectly cast every single person is in yes. the show? It's yes. Like, I'm it's, obsessed it's with. It's like a miracle. <laughs> I'm like obsessed you know? with Madeline Pesch. Be- I, I, yeah. she can't do anything wrong, I don't think. She's great. <laughs> I yeah. don't know why. Her in particular. But you mentioned Lily. Were her and Cole together at the time when you guys were shooting? My my main... I mean, when I, I came for season two, it was just a couple of days because I just had my second baby like a month before that. So oh, wow. And you I looked like that? Oh, my gosh, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was only there for the first chunk of the first season. So I don't think they were dating. I didn't know about it. We would all hang out and I didn't witness anything but then I started to hear stirrings of it and I was like oh that would be perfect because they're just both such strong individuals and so so interesting and smart and kind and it just seems like they're perfect for each other right yeah well they seem like it I mean it seems, it seems to like work it. I show. can't I can't <laughs> attest to it myself having never witnessed it but I would say I endorse it okay all right. <laughs> Did you meet any other CW luminaries while you were shooting? I know some other shows shoot up there, like and um, our podcast covers most of them. Yeah, <laughs> we were we were near Supergirl. Oh, so I did see Melissa. Yeah, Benoist. Yeah, I saw her, but never got to meet her. But it is, yeah, it's like a it's like a nexus of CW action up there. It's like the hotels are swarming with superheroes and. <laughs> <laughs> other characters but yeah for me yeah i don't have much for you on that one sorry guys it's okay oh, it's okay <laughs> would you the proximity was good enough yeah that's that's yeah. more than i was have. near i was near it yeah was close. would you do you think you'd do another project like riverdale that like kind of dark and yeah i mean i find it to be it's so juicy right and and dipping the toe into the water of being sort of a villain. I don't know. Can you call... Is Grundy a villain? She's more of like... She's like villain adjacent. I am. Like sort of with some vulnerable Yeah, because elements. I don't think she's... I don't think she's really an antig- antagonistic force. She just happens to complicate mm-hmm. everything. I mean, I think mm-hmm. for her, I don't know, you can speak to this, it was your character, but it seems like it comes from mm-hmm. a place of having been abused. She yeah. wants to be protected, but by somebody mm-hmm. that she doesn't find a threat. Threatening, right. Like, yeah. that's what it seemed like. But exactly. But it seems like th- the character was received as, like... A sex predator? Yeah. <laughs> Basically. I mean, um, it's so hard. Sadly, yeah. the societal times overlapped a little bit, so... Yeah. There was a little yeah, bit and, of that. You know, I'm okay with, with that impression, because yeah. it's not okay to do things that aren't okay. But it is it is interesting to be an actor who's just, like, doing their thing, trying so hard, <laughs> and then have to have this feedback that's, like whoa <laughs> you know so for me I, I kind of at first was like sort of taken aback by it but then I was like oh this I did something that had an impact on people that's kind of the, sh- the shit got stirred up and that's interesting and I wouldn't be afraid to do something like that again well and if you wanted to accept the mantle villain I mean the, the episode in which you drive off to your next conquest is yeah. I mean, there was a you. You had a nice little play of expression on your face where you could, as the audience member, think, "Oh, maybe she's not really as innocent as we thought." Yeah, yeah. So that was mm-hmm. really good. 
Yeah, we don't endorse teachers sleeping with their students uh, by any means. No, I didn't, that is not the no. initial position of Couch Potatoes. You know. No, it's not. <laughs> it's the opposite of it. Yes. Also, I just want to say that I am a teacher, and boys don't look like that in high school, and they don't smell like no. that either. So it's <laughs> super, it's never crossed my Wait, mind. They don't. They don't smell like that. Have you smelled? Yep. Wait, yes. Teenagers are. Follow up. Well, I don't. I've never smelled. Oh, because teenagers smell bad. They smell bad. bad. They don't smell good. No, mm-hmm. it's bad. Mm-hmm. So I just, I've never. Uh, it's never even. No, it crossed my mind. No. <laughs> well, that got weird. No, it did. Good yeah. job, Sarah. And I Sarah. do what I can. And I appreciate. I appreciate you revealing that about yes, yourself. Sure. Sure. <laughs> we adore you. Do you have any I other? Adore you. She likes us. Hearts, hearts, hearts. Do you yeah. have any other yeah. projects that's coming up? Or I know you said you're kind of being a parent, which is a full-time job. Yeah, I it's get. a full-time job and not as small as you think. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm super enjo- actually enjoying the parenting thing right now. Um, Do you want to come think- parent mine? Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Or let's just have a play date at the very least. Let's do it. Um, next time we're from Michigan. Yeah, you know, I think once my youngest is in preschool, and we'll, we'll explore that again. But for now, we're just enjoying the family life. And it's really nice that Riverdale was the last project I worked on because it has such a life, you know? Yeah. yeah. It feels like, I still feel like such a part of something so big and special that it's like my place. It's like, it's like giving me, it's giving me life right now in, in, a, in a moment where I'm focusing on something else. Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. It is awesome. Yeah. Thank you for talking with us. We love you. Yes, thank you. Very I love you. Much. Thank I you. love you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> thank I you. I can feel for, your love for doing this. What show should I be watching right now? Oh, you guys have good any... question. Well, let's... Riverdale. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <not talking. laughs> yeah. So, what do you generally like, and then we'll go from there. Well, I can go anywhere from like deep dark dark drama, like I, I watched Euphoria, which was like super disturbing, mm-hmm. to like the Great British Baking Show. Is I find very peaceful. I really like The Good Place. I don't know if you've watched yes. that. Highly recommended. Very yeah. smart show. Light. Kristen Bell is delightful. Okay. I'm watching okay. Stranger Things. I know it came out a while ago, but I'm a little behind on season okay. three. If you like scary things, the also um- gross things, mm-hmm. but it's really one of the best shows mm-hmm. on TV right now. The Umbrella Academy no, is no, really no. good. Yeah, if, you, if you're not too deep into superheroes, but you can tolerate the genre, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like Sarah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The Umbrella <laughs> Academy is a riff it's on good. that. Yeah, so it's really good. Oh, okay. I've never even heard of that. Okay, thank you very much. And I needed to learn something today. I appreciate that. I recommend the Furchester Hotel for your children. <laughs> oh, okay. That's on Netflix. Check that out. We're multifaceted in <laughs> our recommendations. Cute. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds super cute. Yeah, you're a one stop shop. Yeah. Well, you know, I gotta. We got have it. to be the TV authority. We're United Cash Potatoes. We do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're watching it all. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> there is so much. And if you're into Star Trek, there's a new <laughs> Star Trek Picard coming out. My husband's made me a Trekkie, so that that's happened since I've seen you last. But Oh, great. Yeah, check that out. Nanu Nanu. I've never, I've never <laughs> seen it, but I, it oh, sounds great. That's Mark and Mindy. <laughs> Oh, oh, it is. Oh, so <laughs> but that's lovely. I have revealed myself. <laughs> You've revealed yourself. <laughs> okay. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. We adore you. Yeah, thank thank you. you so much we for adore talking you. to us. Yeah, my pleasure. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me, Kylie Piet. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast, and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kelsey Resmer. Kelsey played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole kit and caboodle was engineered and produced by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. Give us stars, give us comments, give us reviews. Let us know how we're doing. Send us a message. We might just read it on the podcast. 
Tell us what you like, what you don't like, what we should keep, what we should toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions on shows we might consider, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, where we have a guest book, by email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via our social media, Facebook, Twitter at CPU Podcast, and Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. We always have several more new episodes coming down the pike. Just listen to our Instagram. Intros, and if you miss old episodes or want to know in general what we cover, just find us. We are everywhere and searchable wherever you look for things on the internet. You can search for us or you can subscribe at our website, our channels, our social media accounts. Stay up on our new events and episodes. Until the next time, seasons one through three of Riverdale are available to stream on Netflix, which currently has a CW contract, even if we don't have any contractual obligation to say that. Meanwhile, the fourth season premiered on Wednesday, October 9, 2019 on The CW, and the last five aired episodes are always available to watch at the CW website or CW streaming app. In addition, our Riverdale series panel will next reconvene, very shortly in fact, to discuss season three and the third part of our catch-up miniseries. As always, keep a weathered eye to CPU for all the deets. In the meantime, and until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned. Bye-bye.